Financial Phil, Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Marius Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? We are well, Phil. Where are you right now? Are you driving somewhere? I, I am driving. I was running a little bit behind this morning. I got too caught up in everything that happened this weekend, and I got out of the house a little late. So my apologies if my phone doesn't work as it normally does. Well, that's uh, fair, Phil. Will We're that okay. be will that be to our benefit or not, Phil? It, <laughs> probably, yeah. <laughs> Most likely, yes. Yeah. Uh, before we get to the financial stuff, Phil, this is uh, training camp week. Uh, most teams report to training camp this week. It's time to start some football. Yeah, and it's a, it's an exciting time to put so much uh, care and emotional energy into something that doesn't matter. After the last couple of weeks with all this going on with the politics, and I, I readily admit that I am I am one of those fans that if my team does well, I'll never shut up. I forget about it really, really quick because the adult in me understands that it really doesn't matter. So that's the outlet that sports I've always enjoyed, the outlet in sports to really care about something that just doesn't matter. And I'm excited to care about something that doesn't matter. Let's talk about some things that do matter. Of course, uh, Friday was the big crowd strike issue, and I know their stock at one point when I looked was down like 14% or something. But this morning, and, and here's what I thought. I, I thought the market wants stability. It hates volatility, and it doesn't like when uh, things are upset in the news too much. So I expected that we'd have a lot more red numbers this morning. Instead, the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ are all in positive territory. The NASDAQ is up over 1%, the S&P nearly two-thirds percent. Why, Phil? So that, that's a good question. It could be some rotating back. So while, while you were gone, we had, we had so much stuff last week to really dive into, but we had um, what was referred to as, and I, I'm not saying I buy into this because I really don't, but we referred to it as the Trump trade. You had... Uh, of course, the poor debate performance and then the assassination attempt, and it looked more and more like Donald Trump was going to for sure be the next president. So whatever happened in the market last week, we just called it the Trump trade. Remember I always say we like to just give credit or place blame on whatever top of the headline is, and there could have been some truth to that. There, I'm, I'm sure there's some people, listeners won't like to hear that I don't think that all the politics that's gone on in the last month has really had that much of an impact on the market. But I don't. I don't think it's had that much impact on the market. But there was some truth to a. There was uh, some some words that maybe Taiwan could pay for their own defense, and I think that hurt the chip market a little bit because it's relying upon Taiwan. But really, what last week was was a rotation. If you remember that, we used to talk about that uh, a lot, uh, rotating out of megatech or into other types of technology companies into more value and small cap companies that had trailed it. And that's what we had seen over the past couple of weeks. And really the last month, if you look at the last month's performance, the leader in that, in the, in the large companies, is the Dow. And it's been a while since we've heard that. The Dow has outperformed the S&P and the NASDAQ because it doesn't have so much technology in it. And that darling of, of, of a stock, NVIDIA, that we've been talking about for so long, it's been struggling. It's, I think it's negative over the past month but some of that is rotation and now what we mean by rotation is is we're starting to buy into depressed asset classes that were unfavorable before and in those being uh, more industrials finances or financial companies and small cap companies but where do equity investors get the money to purchase into those where well, i don't i'm just not setting on it in most cases so in most cases you do have to rotate out of what has done well into what hasn't done well. That really is just a sign of the old saying, uh, buy low, sell high, and that is kind of what happened last week. But this morning, you know, to answer your original question, we talked about it some this morning, it's not so much that uh, the markets are, are, are uh, get nervous about uncertainty, but if the candidate is to be Kamala Harris, I think our markets would view that the exact same as they did Joe Biden. So that may bring a little bit of stability because going into the weekend, it was anyone's guess who would be the presidential nominee on that side of the ticket. 
And now, even though it's not for certain, I think it is for more sure that it's going to be Kamal Harris. So that would answer the question as to why the uncertainty of Sunday didn't lead to a further sell-off on Monday morning, at least uh, in the futures markets, at least. I feel more confident, and I think the, the stock market feels more confident today than we did Friday about who was going to be the nominee on the Democratic side. When Trump was elected in 2017, the markets, Crazy night. it was November of 2016, the markets went down like a thousand points overnight. But by the time they opened, it was almost like the direct opposite by the time that we got to 930 that they had completely reversed course. Yes. Uh, Knee-jerk reaction. I remember that because I sat up half of the night kind of chewing my fingernails but was shocked by the end of the next day where it had reversed course and I think finished positive. It did. So the overnight trading was deadly. And then it finished overnight on, on a positive note. And, you know, we say this often. It, it's not, uh, and, and it's not popular because the emotional side of us, we really want who's going to be the president to mean more to our markets. We really, really do. But I think that the, the, the other two branches may be more important as who the president is. If it is, if it's split and there's no red or blue wave, I think that's where our markets perform the best. And I don't know, you know, and, and back to your original question, if it, there was a lot of talk about um, if Joe Biden stayed in, that there would be a down ballot uh, issue as well, where everyone would just go down the ballot and, and vote on the red side because of the displeasure with Joe Biden being the nominee. And that may have been turning around a little bit this morning as well, even though I don't know that Harris polls any better. I, I don't I, I can't really get into that, but as far as the odds are, but the down ballot tickets do look a little bit better, I think. If you proceed, will be a little bit better with Harris at the top of the ticket. Phil, putting uh, politics aside just a minute, why did not CrowdStrike and the failure of one line of coal that literally disrupted the global uh, economy and infrastructure, why did that not have more effect on the market? I thought that it would, and I kind of agree with your question because I, I was surprised that CrowdStrike and anyone that had anything to do with CrowdStrike would be crippled much more so than what it was. But it seems as if that maybe the news cycle, Bill, and John talks about this a lot, that the power of our news cycle and how fast that it is and attention gets swayed pretty quickly. I remember on Friday, and I'm talking about like it was a year ago, but I remember on Friday by lunchtime came around, I was thinking about something else. And I was looking more at, you know, as far as the news cycle goes, back to the presidential election. And I wasn't that much focused on CrowdStrike. And then when I came home and I watched the, the episodes of nightly news that I normally watch, CrowdStrike took up so much less of that than what I thought that it would. And I had a daughter that was getting ready to get on an airplane. So I was worried, is baby girl going to be able to get home? And she got home just fine, so we were fortunate. But uh, all in all, that didn't have the legs that I thought that it would. So I agree with you, and I have no good answer of why that didn't mean more than what it did. It didn't send the ripples throughout the markets that I thought it would, and it didn't have the impact on CrowdStrike and Microsoft that I thought it would as well. You know, I, I don't know if this is a question, it's an observation. We talk about the economy not being the, the markets and that sort of thing. This weekend, my wife and I went down to, uh, went to uh, Tyson's Corner, and the place was packed. Talk about people having spending money, folding money. And it was like Christmas time. You could, the, the parking lots were full. It was impossible to drive around there. But like a dozen of the big stores are closed. I've not seen Barnes & Noble is closed up, a number of the other big, uh, chain stores are all closed up. It's it's this weird kind of um, economic hypocrisy that's going on that I don't I don't really understand. Uh, that apparently stores can't sustain themselves in malls, but people keep going back to the malls. I, it's there's a question in there. There's an opportunity to comment, Phil. <laughs> yeah, well, those are micro examples, and I love micro examples. I love real street examples and you know the the ones that that i love to give are, are those people that were at those malls and those people that are shopping they're going into stores and this is society as a whole so i'm not saying me or you or or any one individual some people take exception when i say this 
but we go in and we still spend the money that we would have done before, and then we complain about it on the way out the door, or we'll make a phone call and say, listen, how much I just paid for, and then fill in the blank, and we complain about it. So overall, as consumers, our the strength of the consumer has kind of been it, – it has been the issue with inflation, and now it's, it's kind of a, a, a positive because our markets are basically baking in that we're not going to go into a recession. And that will be the next talk, though. Make, make, make no mistake about it. When rates do begin to come down, which it looks more, more likely it's going to be September, the next concern will be uh, a, a recession. But at the mo- and we need a strong consumer to prevent that, right? So before we needed this consumer to soften up a little bit to bring inflation down, and that's where it gets confusing, and it's like walk, walking a tightrope. But here in a, in a little while, a month, a month and a half, two months away, we're going to need that consumer to remain strong, remain still buy that stuff and complain about it. I do it. I went to the grocery store and spent one hundred and fifty nine dollars, and I can't tell you what I bought. But at the end of the day, and I complained the whole way, but I still bought it. It didn't change anything that I purchased. But like you said, and I think some of that is a mix, John, of of technology. You know, you said the big box stores that are no longer exist, like Barnes and Noble, and those guys do still struggle. Those those the ones that have the best online presence. Here's another micro example. One of my daughters, I talk about them a lot. They need shoes, and I said, "Well, let's go to Dick's and buy shoes." And both of them said, because both of them are hitting me up for shoes right now, both of them said they won't have exactly what I'm looking for in Dick's. Said, I'll just get them online. And that kept us out of that big box store. I was more than willing to drive them there and get them, but they knew they could get exactly what they want in the silly colors that they want and ship to our house in a day or two. And I'll just get those online. And I think what we're seeing in the malls is browsing. They're still shopping and they're still spending money, but they're kind of browsing as a more more of an event than it is that I'm going to go purchase this or I'm going to go purchase that. But the big box stores do still struggle, and I don't know that that's it's associated as much with our economy as it is the ease of use on technology because look at Amazon and look at online sales compared to in-person sales, and that started to change before COVID, and it was exaggerated during COVID, and that's continued on. Yes, to reinforce your daughters, I have the same approach. I will go to a box store under the greatest duress. I I will automatically go to Amazon for something as simple as buying a pair of socks or some combs. So it's uh, I I'm, I'm a full converter, have been fully converted to using a um, uh, online shopping. John, when was the last Man, time you bought a comb? <laughs> really? Really? I, I haven't bought one in a long time either, bro. I'm with you. Wow. You haven't wow. been a whole week and you land on him with that. My goodness. I don't, I, Phil, I haven't bought a comb in years either, so, I, you know, I'm just saying. I don't use a comb. I don't either. You know, you just, you know, the palms with my hands. That's all I need. Yeah. Phil, this is, this is anecdotal, and I haven't researched it otherwise to find information on it, but uh, from uh, three different generation age groups, at different ends of the earning spectrums, I'm hearing it is becoming more and more difficult to find a job now. Is there any economic data to back that up? And I got it from no, uh, young, it's, younger it's, well, people yeah, getting out of school, people in their 30s. And my other example was my neighbor who was at an executive pay level and got let go over a year ago. And it, it took her over a year to find another job. Uh, yes, there is, but when you take a snapshot of where our labor market is, it's still strong. It's not as strong as what it was for, say, a year ago, six months ago, and that's some of that data that has leading you. Your anecdotal it is correct. It is more difficult, but it's not in the in the context of history. It's not more difficult than than normal. It's more difficult than what it has been the last six months or one year, especially higher paying jobs are difficult to find uh, right now. So some of that labor market that, that was at, well, at one point, it's just like the consumer, con- consumer strength and our willingness to spend. At one point we wanted to, and we still kind of do it a little bit, we wanted to see that soften so that the Federal Reserve could begin the rate cutting process. But once that we get near that or it's a certainty that we're in that process, we're going to want to see that, that uh, labor market strengthen up yet again to ease our fears about a recession. So, it, and that's a tightrope that the Federal Reserve has to walk, and they're walking right now, and they'll continue to walk that. But as I've said before, you know, I stand up for Jerome Powell. 
I think he's done a pretty good job with it. You know what I'm seeing in, in my line of work, um, not as the author, but on the other side of it with editors and publishers and such, New York publishing is collapsing on itself in large part because of COVID and working at home and, and office spaces are going away and what have you. It's shifting more and more to freelance work, which is essentially part-time work that comes without benefits. And so for folks who have the for the traditional positions it used to be an editorial position for a publishing house and then you go you, you move up for the, through the ranks those are going away and they're becoming essentially uh, part-time or freelance positions where there's zero overhead for the publisher and that seems to be more and more the case i think there are a lot more part-time positions that are available than than there used to be as opposed to the full-time positions do you feel that that's that way uh, Phil, a lot of things are shif shifting toward part time instead of full time. Yes, it's part time because of you. And, and you look at companies who are trying to still turn a profit. And I know that sometimes is a dirty word, uh, or people don't like to see companies make money. But at the end of the day, and, and remember, with this inflation, what's one of the things that has gone up more more so than anything else is insurance. So if if I have to provide a full time employee insurance. That could be a problem, and that could be a hindrance to me hiring someone. But if I hire a freelancer or if I hire someone part-time, I don't have to concern myself with paying for that insurance, and I can keep my employee costs down. So that is more and more likely. And in, in conjunction with that, let's go back to uh, COVID days. And COVID hit, will, will have a lasting impact. In some ways, it would be good, but it will have a lasting impact on our economy. But we've talked about those entry and exit level positions and those exit level positions that could, they seek out part-time work. They don't want a full-time job. They know they're, they're 65, 70, 75. They don't want to work full-time anymore, but they want to do something. And man, look at these wages I can make for doing this part-time work when I want, how I want. And I don't have that same responsibility that I did during my normal working years. And they are paying higher wages, but part of that reason is to tra attract those in. And then going back to the COVID, the COVID uh, easing of our economy where we had enhanced and extended unemployment, it kind of forced these companies into paying a higher wage than what they used to in order to compete with what it was, what people could make just simply by staying home. We were on a tech rally uh, for the last two months until this past week or so. Uh, Phil, today Google and Tesla uh, report earnings. If they knock it out of the park, are we expecting another uh, resumption of the tech rally? If they knock it out of the park in, re in, in Google, per se, if they knock it out of the park in relationship to what was expected, I don't know that it would lift all boats. It would certainly lift Google. Tesla is a different bird because Tesla's earnings may not be as important as the robo taxi debut that comes next month i think that is huge for tesla and tesla has done well of late uh i don't know about last week but it has done well of late and i think a lot of that is anticipation of that robo taxi and a less expensive model to enter in to compete with other car brands or your your gas model you know the price point for those so it's not a hindrance for people to uh, on a purchase price so I think the robo taxi debut may be more important than Tesla's earnings. I think our our, our view of Tesla may be more of a view that we that uh, investors trust Elon Musk and that they will be profitable. So I, I don't know that Tesla's earnings could be as important to them as Google's earnings are to them. I think the most important one is probably Nvidia that's coming up later on. You know, the first two times, and, and we'll talk about Nvidia more and more and more. But it's been such a bellwether through 2024 and really drug up the NASDAQ and the S&P. NVIDIA has been one that has struggled of late and one of the reasons why the Dow has outperformed it. Could you please pronounce these stocks correctly? It's Tesla and NVIDIA. <laughs> NVIDIA? <laughs> NVIDIA. I've never heard that one. I heard the test, but I've never heard the NVIDIA. Tell him, he, Bill. Tell yeah. him. I'm not about to try either one. I'm now, Rob. He, he's got the spotlight on me, Phil. They, I knew where the question was coming from. I said, he's going after everybody. <laughs> he is. That's right. You, Rob, I got canceled last week. <laughs> I mean, I said, I got a text message from Hornby late on Sunday, and he's like, hey, there's too much stuff going on. I don't know that I want to talk about money. And I was like, well, I, I understand. I completely get it. But I was listening in. 
And I said, Rob wouldn't have canceled me. Rob would have had me on there. I could have, I, I could have came on and still talked. But amen. I understood completely. So yeah. I'm not giving Mike a hard time. I would have canceled me too. Well, he's Rob's had a whole week to relax, and he's coming back uh, bristled. Cranky. <laughs> Cranky, yeah. Hey, let me go back to politics for a couple of minutes. Uh, we look at, we've talked a great deal about the, the Trump impact, the uh, Biden now Harris impact uh, on our local U.S. market. We've talked very little about the uh, the European market, and we are in a global uh, uh, global market these days. Uh, have you, is there any indication at all of what a Trump impact will be on the European market? Yes. Yeah, and, and I'll just and I'll I'll expand that out to international to everyone, yeah. and and it would be the same as what it was during his first four years. He's mo- more likely to impose more tariffs. There's already tariffs that exist, but he's likely to impose more tariffs, which could hurt the international market, and and that's some of what we're seeing going into the you know when we talk about Jerome Powell and he's not supposed to be political. That really really does put him in a position because. If he does impose more tariffs on day one, and I'm not saying they're good or bad. I, I don't want to make anyone think I'm making an opinion on whether or not additional tariffs are good or bad. I'm not. But additional tariffs would be an inflationary pressure. And if we have an inflationary pressure, does that play into the – it's funny, I always take everything back to Jerome Powell. But does that play a role into how quickly they decrease rates if they say, hey, we've got an inflationary pressure that's likely to come – so instead of having one or two rate cuts or three rate cuts in 2024, will we only have one and then continue those on through 20, uh, 2025, maybe take a break because of that? But international markets, if you perceive that Donald Trump would win, I think it, the, the overall belief is that foreign markets would struggle more so under that because of the tariffs. We're such a purchaser of other people's goods and services, and if there's more tariffs on those, it would hurt their profitability or their sales one way or the other. It's going to, it's going to hurt that and damage that, and that would be a negative toward international equities. I think the uh, Elon Musk, uh, clearly, if you read his tweets, is in the Trump camp. And, $30 million a month, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it makes sense if you think about this because he needs – people to continue getting subsidies to buy those electric vehicles. <laughs> it's a smart play on his part economically, Phil. So I think uh, Elon's playing the, the right uh, end of the coin there. Hey, uh, Phil, uh, last minute here. How do we get in touch with you for more information today and for your lovely guidance? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Phil, thank you kindly. Have yourself a wonderful day. Thank you, guys, all three. Have a great one. Have thank a good you, sir. You can catch Phil weekday mornings at 638 for two minutes on uh, what happened the day before and setting up that day's market action and uh, other things going on in the economy.